You're listening to the Board Game Snobs podcast, a ridiculous podcast with ridiculous hosts that discuss ridiculous things. And any mention of board games is purely coincidental. And so, without further ado, and with a heavy dollop of shame and embarrassment on my part, I give you the Board Game Snobs. <laughs> Welcome to the Board Game Snobs Podcast. This is Jerry, your favorite star of the board game Mill New. Is what's Mill New mean? I don't know. Jerry, Gobby, you here? Gobby's here. Hello, I'm here. Gobby is here as well. I am the host of the Board Game Snobs. And by host, I mean I'm always here. I'm steady as a rock. I produce the show. I edit the show. I am on the show. I let's see what don't I do for this Could show? There, well, I bleed you don't, for this show. You t- <laughs> say anything interesting for the show? All right, enough about you. I uh, take the brunt of Jerry's sarcastic, demeaning remarks for the show. My remarks aren't demeaning. What's demeaning of this? Anyways, so by the time you're listening to this, we should be gearing up for Board Game Geek Spring 2023. If you have a game that you'd like us to play or talk about or anything of that nature, please send us an email at boardgamestops at gmail.com or post it in our Facebook group. This particular episode will be coming out, let's see, one... The, two, nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Because May they're listening. Third. Why do they care? Because they're listening to it on I May third. I like to schedule things out for I myself. I know, but why you do you much. need to Stop say yelling it? at me? Why do you Stop need to yelling say it? at me? Why do you need to say it on the show when nobody cares? I like to say it. Can I not That's, say it? What did it yes. hurt? What did it, it hurt? hurt? It hurt me. Your ramblings hurt me deeply. What game are we talking about? I forget. Do you have We're any banter? We're going to discuss Garden Bell. But first, have you ever heard of, I'm not quite sure how to say this, scopolamine? Yeah. Or scopolamine? Yeah. Or scopolamine? Yeah. This is from the scienceexplorer.com, which the uh, web address has let me know this website is not secure. This is from December 23rd, 2015. Scopolamine, colon... Space. Is this mind control drug the most dangerous in the world? No. After inhaling the quote unquote devil's breath, victims have been known to wake up with no memory of withdrawing their life savings and giving it away. Okay. Scopolamine so- dub, the devil's breath, is often referred to as the most dangerous drug in the world, mainly prevalent in South America. The drug is used to commit the perfect crime. While under the influence of scopolamine, someone could convince you to willingly withdraw and give away your life savings from your bank account, but you would wake up and remember nothing. It's inception. I use this drug literally every day. We use it in hospice all the time. Oh, so that's where how you built your house. It all no. comes out in the wash. It's just used for nausea. Most, yeah, I mean that's that's it's for mm-hmm. like yeah. That's all it does. Yeah, you're with big medicine, aren't you? Is your is your middle name Pfizer by any chance? No, it's just a common drug we used all the time. But I think I the do, devil's breath do. is powder, though. Like that's the powder form of it. If I'm not if I'm not mistaken, like what well, we just used- mean, also known as burundanga is derived from nightshade plants. The drug is odorless and tasteless, and in high amounts can be lethal. So it could also be a deadly drug. Oxygen can be lethal. Anything can be lethal. The top legal dosage for scopolamine is set at 0.33 milligrams, and a dose of just 10 milligrams would be enough to send someone into a coma and possible death. Whatever. 
It says, of course, since the drug can potentially strip someone of all rational thinking, scopolamine is surrounded by conspiracy theories. It's said to have the abilities of a truth serum, and some stories claim that the drug was used in Nazi Germany as an interrogation tool, according to The Guardian, the most trusted oh, of all sources. Okay, here's, here's the thing that upsets me when they write articles about stuff like this you remember the whole fit nail thing and everybody like oh if you touch something that has fit nail on it you pass out you're gonna die yes yeah that doesn't happen that's false that's that's literally people having a panic attack that that is not true and yet because that was reported one time on the news everybody has that in their head and now that's like because it's been completely debunked it's not a thing i mean i can't count how many fit nail patches i've put on people i've touched fit nail I, I, patches I, like every day and have never passed out from it that explains so much it doesn't work that way but yet because people think that that's what happens to them but yet and because now it keeps we know getting, the whole nine yards about you it keeps getting reported on the news so people keep believing that mess and that's that this is the same thing with this stuff people just hear stuff and then they go oh and they get into their head and they think it's true and then they just they believe it and it gets in their head, and they then they do it. It's just, it's just I, ah. Well, it remains somewhat of a mystery why scopolamine related crimes seem to happen so frequently only in South America. If you haven't even heard of the drug until now, it's because scopolamine drugging rarely happens anywhere else around the world. So it appears that places in South America are the only ones enduring the severe scopolamine related crimes. But the history of the drug and how it seems to start strip its victims of free will remains more of an enigma. That sounds like an article written by someone that's anti-South American. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like somebody who's anti-scopolamine. The scopolamine My made me do from it. Chile. Am I a scopolamine baby? Does he remember making me? Probably not. He probably regrets it. <laughs> oh, he does. Burn. He does every day. Burn. I see you're drinking another yard. It's 16 ounces. That's not. That's a foot long. No, no, I'm drinking 12 ounces. The glass is a 16 ounces glass. Long. No, I see you had a big old boot. <laughs> Five dollar foot long. You're really dating yourself with that one in this economy? I don't think so. Yeah, isn't that weird? That used to be a thing. The five dollar foot long at Subway. Eat fresh. And we were convinced that that was healthy when it's not. Like just when the bread has been classified as like uh, cake because it's so full of sugar. <laughs> You're eating. Could you imagine just eating a piece of cake? Two cuts of cake and meat in between it, basically. That much sugar. Like, you ever bought like the, the angel food cake like at Walmart or something? Oh, yeah. I love that stuff. I, love I do, too. That stuff. I do, too. Imagine making a sandwich out of that. That's Subway. That's what Subway's doing. That's basically Hawaiian sweet rolls, which everybody knows is the best sweet rolls. Ooh, Hawaiian you are sweet rolls. Correct, sir. Now, listen. Listen. Hawaiian sweet rolls. Rolls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting tongue tied. I'm, I'm my mouth is watering just thinking about this because I I love these sandwiches. You sound like, love, you sound like Homestar One uh, Hawaiian well, sweet rolls. So I like funeral sandwiches, which are Hawaiian sweet rolls, and then ham, and then you get you a good melty cheese and some Worcester sauce and some onion powder and some mustard, and you mix that up in the sauce, and then you glaze all that. And you let it sit for a while, and then you cook them 400 degrees for about 30 minutes. And they come out, these hot little sandwiches, on, and they're good. Have you ever had funeral sandwiches? I don't think, I don't, can't say that I have, but it sounds delicious. I've made funeral sandwiches, but I well, guess you I, need to make some for me. I thought I made I'm some. I'm coming for you. over I, Sunday, by the way. I, I made some the other day. Yeah, you came Not to my when house. I was there. I know, but I made it at work. I make funeral sandwiches at work. Which you don't have to have somebody who's dead to make funeral sandwiches. Well, <laughs> being that you work in a hospice facility, I feel like every day's a funeral day. Every day's a holiday. <laughs> no, no, that's not right. But no, they call them funeral sandwiches because they're easy to make. That, well, there's lots of th macaroni and cheese is easy to make, but it's not considered funeral macaroni. Yeah, they are. They're funeral ronies. Funeral, <laughs> funeral, funeral. Yeah, funeral, yeah, that would be a great brand. 
funeroni, and they're just little coffin shaped macaronis with a I lot am of cheese. Funeroni, fewer, fewer roni. That's the that's the not <laughs> that's not, I'm not going there. You're gonna bait me. I seen what you were doing. The fueroni. I seen what you were trying to do. I see you laughing at me. You were trying to bait that's me. If, the- that's if he had been raised in Italy. Don't. Benito Fusilini? Don't. Not in this, not in this, yes, don't. Not in this climate. That will not get us a Golden Geek <laughs> award for this podcast. <laughs> Making feuder Roni checks. <laughs> Let's, I don't know where you could cut all this, but maybe you can later. Anyways, enough with the banter. Um, all right. And go. <laughs> 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 oh, that just hits differently. And now a hard merge into board games. 25th Century Games, which is our friend Chad Elkins. Thank you, Chad Elkins, for sending us. What's this game? Garden Bomb? Garden Bow? Garden Bow. Spell it. Garden Bow. G A R T. T? Yes. G A R T E N B A U. Garten Bau. Garten Bau. What does that mean? Collect seedlings, purchase plants, and grow flowers. Become a Gartenmeister. A uh, Garten Bau. Let's see if they explain it here in the de- description on Board Game Geek. They Garten do not. Bau is the masculine noun. Remember that in German. Oh boy, this macaroni Hitler thing's coming to play now. <laughs> Both the spelling of the word and the article preceding the word can change depending whether it is the nominative, accusative, genitive, or dative case. Dick wow, Hottenbau. Wow, wow, wow. I did not understand nothing you said. Uh, well, it's all in German. Dis din Gottenbau. Gartenbau Landos. I don't know what I'm saying. This is not... What I'm, does it mean? Does it mean garden? Horticultural. You're a it horticultural. Means horticultural? Horticultural. Horticulture, the process or practice of studying and growing plants. So I guess horticulture was probably already a game, and someone just said, let's just do garden bow, which I'm not saying that right, I don't think, but it doesn't matter. This is a pretty game, and this is a tile-laying game, and I hate tile-laying games, but this was okay. Like This yeah, game a- is quite simple, a nice rondelle. That's my boy. You're taking your wheelbarrow in a rondo fashion around the board. You can jump over a spot if the player is in front of you. You can surpass spots if you have the resources to lay down in those spots, to like every other rondo. Otherwise, you just go to the next spot. You can plant flowers. You can purchase seedlings. Or you can lay down these other tiles, which I don't know what they mean, but... Those big tiles that are kind of like the big points of the game. You remember what yeah, it's like called? the flower. That's the flowers. Like that's the big garden thing you've made. So there's several decisions to be made. Well, not decision to be made. It's more of an order. And to me, that's a thematic thing about this game. You do the seedlings. It grows into a plant. And then you kind of like, I don't know, pot it and make it look pretty. And that's like more points. I like that about this game. There's a natural progression to the tile laying and those are your points the seedlings aren't points but once it grows into a flower that's points and then these other tiles you lay on there they're mega points and or they give you bonus points for green leaf flowers or something like that they're like in-game points this game is very smooth very easy i would say entry level not like ticket to ride entry level to me this is a little bit deeper slightly i would play this over ticket to ride any day of the week i don't care for ticket really? to ride anymore really yes really yeah i keep saying really okay i really was impressed with this game really <laughs> yes and uh now for advanced gamers such as jerry and myself Really? This is not one I would return to on a regular basis with Jerry and Enrique, my frequent gaming group. But this is a game I would introduce people to the world of gaming with. It's yeah, it pretty. Is- it's nice. It's easy. It's smooth. Really liked this game in that regard. Yeah, it's very light and it's very nice. That This is a, like I would. It's rated a 2.2 on uh, weight on uh, BGG, but I think it's actually quite 
much lighter than that, in my opinion. And it is. It's very simple. This rondelle, go move here, pick something up, get some resources, use those resources to plant stuff in your little garden, tile lighting. It felt very Uwe Rosenberg light to me, like this type of theme and everything, very having your own little garden and placing stuff on it and all that with the tiles and so it, it, it seems like a very old classic game and so yeah i i it, i agree with you everything you said this is a very light game i enjoyed it i think that this would be a great game to introduce other people into the uh into the hobby with i i'm, I'm looking up other 25th century games and i'm surprised like raw, raw has come out he come redid out. raw that's which a big is a one great game Resist, which is a solo game, which I have. I have not got to play it. Fantastic. I played that. it. I really enjoyed it a lot. We, I we didn't enjoyed- realize that was 25th century. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, nice get, Chad. Yeah. Uh, Toot and Common, we which we played. Chad we enjoyed that. Show. Ve- uh, Velo, uh, I can't pronounce this. Velamino. It's the uh, Bruno Cathala, very light. Um, it's a, I don't want to say it's a trick taking game. It's a card game, where it's it's more. It is a trick taking game, and it's 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 a animal game, and my kids really liked it. Um, like that's like one of their go to games now. And Chad Chad sent me that game by the way. And Winner Winner Chicken Dinner, also a game my kids love. And Kingswood, also a game my kids Kingswood, love. Kingswood, I really liked Kingswood and Jurassic Parks. Parts, P-A-R-T-S, is another game. My wife really likes that game. There's a lot. And Curmudgeon was the one that we did with the insults. That yeah, we did our own 25th world. century. He's really got his claws in this like light to light medium style of gaming. That's so I wonder really, how he's, like a lot of good games there. How is he getting all these games? Like, is he just We need to have him, him on and discuss this with him. He works out all the time. <laughs> if he can ever clock out of Gold's Gym and come on the Board Game Snobs podcast, we'd love to talk to Chad. He's not a Gold's Gym. I would say the worst thing about Chad is his name is Chad. He's a 24... Is it 24-hour? What's the gym? The 20... Remember the hanging Chad debacle of the yes, 2000 a- election? Al Gore? Like, Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Cost Al Gore the hanging thing. Chad. I've never heard of a hanging Chad. I, I when Ch- Chad Elkins and Chad Chesson heard all about the hanging Chads. I bet when Chad Elkins is doing a chin up and he won't let go and he's just hanging there, <laughs> he's just there. That brings back there like he is. The, there he is. You, you broke the election. Al Gore walks by and freaks out. <laughs> this is. <laughs> This is why we have global warming. I'm glad uh, I invented the internet. He didn't, though. He really didn't invent the internet. He just, I think he enacted legislation that helped. I'm not sure who, I forget who it was. I looked that up one time, who invented the internet, and it wasn't me. I watched the uh, Fablemans some time ago. About uh, It's basically a biography of Steven Spielberg, and I didn't realize his father was like, one of the early pioneers of computers, like in general, like he was really like one of the guys that got computers started, like the inner workings of computers. It was, uh, that was interesting. The movie as a whole, mm, boring. It was Wouldn't awful. That'd be awful. Like to be back in the day where you invent the internet and like, maybe you go into a coma and then they wake you up now, and you're old, and they're like, this thing you invented, this is it. And the first thing you log into is like TikTok, and you just see, like, twerking People or whatever. Twerking. Yeah. Yes, it's like that. That's, that's like, you know, twerking is so old. Like, that's such an old reference, but yet it's still relevant, because they still do it. But we're strongly anti-twerking here. I mean, I don't know. I've, no, I've taken a hard anti-twerking stance. It's a skill. It's no, a skill. No. Have you ever no. tried it? Yes, I'm anti twerking. <laughs> You've tried it. Yes. I am completely against it. When did you try it? And how? I, and where I, were you? I was at the gym. And what was the song? Did you just twerk on your own or did you have a song playing? I, oh, I, are you pleading the fifth? <laughs> no, I might be conf- confused. Wait a twerking minute. Twerking is when you get down 
and basically you squat and you thrust your hips to and fro. Oh, oh no, no. What's the thing where you lay on the floor, but you <laughs> hit off on planking. your- okay. That's planking. Okay. All right, all right. I take that back. Okay. We're anti-planking. Two very, very We're different anti- things. Anti-planking. Planking. planking, good for the core. That's what. That's real big with the fitness these days. Good for the core. Okay. Planking is what I did. Planking, I think, would bring the world together and be healthy. I don't think twerking is doing anything. If we all planked, we would be in a better oh, place. I think twerking became popular with uh, Miley Cyrus and Plank. the guy from uh, Growing Pains of Sun. Plank for Alan Peace. Thick. That's my Robin new movie. Thick. Robin Thick. Plank for Peace. Yes. Plank for Peace. Everybody just lay down. Robin Thick is that the guy? It's Alan Thick's son. He made a song, and he got like I don't know. He was kind of canceled, and I don't. Is know. that you the know, guy? So that, is that, that the happens. guy that was? What's the song? The ooh, with the they all say that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is that is that no. him? The the no, I don't know what you're saying. Do, 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 do. What's that song? Where he's he's you know, uh huh yeah is the baby shark I guess I don't know what is that <laughs> yeah they were singing baby shark just then blurred lines he's the blurred lines guy I don't remember him he's date he the the lady that was in the music video is now the guy of right. SNL who's really ugly's girlfriend oh my god you really Pete went Daverson. a lot of places Pete Daverson Pete Daverson's yes. girlfriend. <laughs> Pete Daverson, he's, yes. Yeah, he's his girlfriend, Ro, Emilia Rodzianowski. I can't keep... Emily Rodzianowski, Rodakowski. Yes. Oh, my God. She's I'm, the sister all to influencers. the... All influencers. This, this, actually, this whole discussion is making me nauseous. She's in the, the Resident Evil shows. The sister oh to the... Oh, my God. Right? <laughs> Pro, what's that lady's name? Mia Hovavich. That's what I Jovovich. said. Jovovich. 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 I don't know. It's a soft J. uh, I'm not. That's not me. This is Jerry, and I'm done with this episode because I'm hard because I plank. Planking is difficult. Me and Chad. Chad's a planker. If he planked on top of the jungle gym, he would be a hanging Chad. Chad's a plank. We had an email we were supposed to read. Hang on. Let me look it up because I do the best readings of emails. Let's (laughs) see. Um... I'm glad was, we start with the the most recent. Sean Franco. What kind of board game? Sh- Franco. Is he related is to it, James? I don't know. He looks it. He looks very Franco-ish. Uh, what kind of board games best convey story or narrative for you? Which mechanics best complement narrative? And what specific games have, have had the best stories? Thank you. And Jerry was probably right about whatever you were arguing about just before reading this letter. Uh, what kind of board games best convey story or narrative for you? I would say games like King's Dilemma or even games such as Game of Thrones. Things where, where the, the narrative kind of develops from the player's actions, not so much from the story that the game is telling. I guess it's simple with, with like kind of RPG type games where the narrative is already spelled out, but games where. It, it, it affords itself from the players doing certain actions, and it tells a story, so to speak. Kind of like with Zaya, those sandbox games. Well, that's what I was going to say is, you mentioned King's Dilemma. I honestly could not tell you anything about what we were doing in our plays of King's Dilemma. You read what they tell you the narrative is. To me, that's not fun. I mean, I, I enjoy it while I'm playing it, but... I much prefer the narrative of games to the most recent one that we played, Nemesis Lockdown. We right. were on this planet. We were down there fighting. The game does not provide that. It does not say, you are doing this. Now do this. You're in it. Not lots of written material. It's just a dungeon crawling action selection type of game. So like Nick but Sandbox games. Game. Like Western yeah. Legends. Uh, yes. Zaya. those to me provide yeah. the most narrative because we have the most fun playing them ridiculous things happen i can tell you what happened in zaya that cracks me up i can tell you what happened in nemesis lockdown that cracks me up those type of games i remember we've played king's dilemma several times i enjoyed it uh, just like uh, uh what's the one that the guy that does all the art for like above and below Near and far. Near Ryan and far. Lockett. 
Near and Far literally is a narrative game. You go here, turn to this page, read what the story tells you you are experiencing. I don't care for that because I don't actually usually feel like I'm experiencing that near as much as when I'm playing Nemesis Lockdown and I'm creating the story in my head. That's that's me. So, and, it's, I, and I would agree with that to an extent. One, because your memory is bad. So, of course, you're going to forget a lot of the already true, prefab true. narratives. But I would say that the best narratives come from the imagination of the players filling in the blanks. So don't don't spell everything out for us. Don't tell us exactly every single detail, what's going on. Let the players create the narrative and let them have the, afford them the ability to be able to fill in the blanks. Give them the structure, give them the framework, and then let them flesh it out. And I think that sandbox games do that a lot. And like Western Legends, uh, Nemesis, and Zaya, and any type of sandbox game like that, has always provided us, especially like uh, Star Wars Rebellion, things of that nature, have always given us a uh, or an uh, Imperial Assault has always given us the ability to play and be able to come up with our own narratives, and I think those are the most meaningful. You mentioned Game of Thrones, and that's not a sandbox game. That is a straight, you know, area well, control type well, game. But the narrative came from the negotiations and some of how the t- battles developed. It is just the imagination. To me, it's more the imagination of, like, I remember clear moments, and we've discussed them before on this episode, of the Game of Thrones. Things that went awry for me when I've teamed up with certain people. Jerry betrays me. Uh, me and a DJ invading the same place. And there's like, I just remember certain things from that game. And it is not, by no means a sandbox game, but it is ne- negotiation games <coughs> that have battle and like that involved in them do lend themselves to s- story driven things. Player wise, it's all player driven though. Now, I, and I'm going to, I'm going to build off what you just said there because this is going to be somewhat controversial. And I'm going to upset some people, but that's what I do here. That's why I'm the star of the show. I think that a lot of your stories come from, as you just said, it's player driven. The players produce the narrative, which means that if you're playing with people who just aren't that interesting, you're not going to have an interesting narrative. Some of our finest moments in the games that we have played that I remember has come from the players taking a game that's either average or above average and producing a narrative, such as you brought up near and far. I remember the red Knight that Enrique burned into our brains because he kept following that storyline throughout near and far. That was a great storyline for him. That would not have worked with any other player. Enrique developed that narrative. I remember playing uh, Lords of Vegas and you not buying up any casinos and just going everywhere and gambling that created a narrative. There are games that the narratives are just produced because the player themselves are actual characters. They're people who are able to make the, to, to make circumstances interesting. So if you're playing a well uh, a, a game that has a well crafted narrative or a game that affords the players to create their own, and you're playing those games with just dull average people i say average like that's a bad thing but it is because i think everybody on the board game stops is above average um as well as our listeners supporters on patreon um <laughs> then you're just not going to our get patreon the narrative you need above above average yes it is. yes that's what that's our next level our 40 dollar a month uh level is uh, our narrative level uh uh uh, feeling support, average uh, support us on patreon you will be above average of average but yes i think that that is the the key are you playing these games with interesting people people who will go out and even make a story out of nothing and when you're playing with creative people games are elevated anyways and that's that's just how i feel which is why i prefer to play board games with the people that i play board games with because Bubba and Enrique and Gabi and, and DJ and all these people are ones that will pull out stories from the ether. They can see abstract things and take that and, and weave a story into it. And they do that naturally. And those types of people are just ones that, that just elevate a game. So sometimes, sometimes it's just the players 
And I I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Sean Franco, other than sometimes the player elevates the game and produces his own narrative. And I'm not going to say anything, but, you know, I could weave a narrative out of Uno. I'm that talented. This is why I'm the star. I agree. (laughs) No one is more self-complimentary than Jerry. I agree with what you have said, though. It it is player-driven. He says which mechanics best complement narrative. (sighs) For me, My battling. Own narrative. <laughs> for me, battling because it's always funny, you know, when somebody thinks they have something in hand and it goes awry, or the dice don't go your way, or the odds seem super in your favor, and then they turn against you. That's always classic. Or you make that one in a million shot that does win you the game. Uh, those type of dice rolling or uh, kind of chance driven battles. Those are complementary to narrative and also negotiation. I mean, that's just kind of part of it. Is the I hate negotiation, but it is very complementary, providing a narrative to games. Do you Indeed. agree or disagree? Indeed. I, everything I said is right. Okay. And then he says, in what specific games have had the best stories? And we've mentioned those in the process of this discussion. So... Asked and answered Sean Franco, cousin of James and Dave. Well, that's going to do it for this podcast. We appreciate all that you do for us. If you want I'm us to. the one that ends the show. I know, but I'm ending it. Feels weird. I know. Let it be. Let it wash over you. Huh, if you okay. have a game that you'd like us to play while we're at BGG Spring, or you're going to be there and you'd like to meet us in person, or to look us in the eye, then send us an email. But unless you're a Patreon, we won't look you back in the eye. We will not. We will not acknowledge your You existence. have to be at a certain level of said Patreon <laughs> to get eye contact. <laughs> the five dollar a month eye three contact. Do, three dollar uh, you get eye contact. Five dollar yes. you get a handshake. $20, yeah. you get a hug. Oh, man. The $20 hugs. Oh. <laughs> $20 hugs. No them out. I feel like I should just walk up to somebody, hug, hug them. And when they, when I walk away, like in their back pocket is like a business card that just has my PayPal information saying, you've been hugged. <laughs> Please send $20. Your cash app username. My cash app. My cash app. <laughs> Oh, that'd be good. All right. Well, you started the wrap up, but you haven't finished like I do. I, I'm. I just. I lost interest. You're in. A, you're in unfamiliar ground. That's right. Yeah, well, All right. I, I, so, I, I, thank you for listening. This has been the Board Game Snarls Podcast. Garden Bow is a good game. Check it out from 25th Century Games. It's very nice and pleasant. Get people that are new or interested in gaming into the board gaming the hobby as they say i'm gobby this is jerry bye bye thank you for tolerating this episode of the board game snobs stay classy